Hey guys, welcome to your 29-2 notes part 2. We are going to continue talking about the Greeks and um, right now we're going to focus on Greek ideas about government. So different forms of government developed in each city-state in Greece. Okay, we've already talked about how these different city-states in Greece were very different because uh, basically geography separated them. So um, they just didn't have as much interacting as you would think, even though they were in a relatively geographically small area. So um, many of these city-states were led by kings, but even in different city-states, sometimes how they picked kings was different. So um, in some city-states, it was, you know, how you would think about a king. You know, a king rules his entire lifetime. He passes away, usually the eldest son. Um, then becomes the king. Some city-states did do it that way, but others of them um, actually would like vote on a new king once the, the king that had been there before passed away. So there were different ways of doing things. Later on, aristocracies developed, and aristocracy is a government that is led by a small privileged upper class. So um, this idea of aristocracy sort of sort of replaces these monarchies or like being ruled by kings. Um, basically, to summarize an aristocracy, it's basically a government that is ran by rich men. Um, that's pretty, pretty much all it was at this time. Athens was one of the first Greek city-states to develop a democratic government. So Athens was basically the, the first to do this. Um, and in fact, the United States, we get many of our ideas about government from Athens, okay? Uh, democracy was a brand new concept in ancient Greece, okay? This was something that had never been done before. Um, the idea of being able to, to vote on items, giving the public the right to vote, it was not heard of at the time. So this was um, a very progressive uh, move on the part of Athens. Athens was a direct democracy, which meant that all citizens participated directly in government, not through representatives, which basically means anytime there was an issue that needed to be voted on, all of the citizens of Athens voted on that issue. So um, today in the United States, you know, we vote for people to decide on issues for us, okay? We have, uh, you know, our senators, our representatives, those people take care of voting on those big issues for us. In a direct democracy, it's not like that. The people themselves are voting individually on every single issue that arises in the government. So obviously today that wouldn't really be feasible because people, you know, just don't have time to every single day maybe going uh, go to vote on an issue. Um, in Athens, however, it was considered your civic duty to do so. Um, to be a citizen of Athens meant to vote on the issues that the, the city-state of Athens presented for you to vote on. So Athenian democracy, although progressive, was still extremely limited. Only Athenian citizens could participate. And the people who were considered citizens in Athens were free men born in Athens. So women couldn't vote. Foreigners couldn't vote. Slaves couldn't vote. Um, it was, you know, a very limited group of people that actually had that right to vote. All right, the search for the truth. Let's talk about some philosophers. So Greek philosophers believed that the search for the truth was a basic duty, um, that it was a human thing to do. They sought to discover natural laws that explained the universe. So... Um, with the Greeks, we see this thought process emerging like, oh, hey, maybe this natural disaster occurs because of weather instead of the gods being mad at us, um, you know, or maybe there's an answer for this thing that's scientific, or maybe people think this way because that's how our minds are built. Um, instead of just basing every single thought off of, oh, it's the gods. Um, so this thought process starts to emerge that, hey, you know, maybe there's more to it. So by using reason, experimentation, and observation, Greek thinkers made advances in subjects like mathematics, astronomy, biology, and other sciences. Okay, 
So um, lots of advancements were made in this time because people in, in Greece were moving away from the thought process that everything happens solely because the gods say that it do. Okay. Um, one of the greatest Greek philosoph philosophers, excuse me, was a man named Socrates. So um, like Confucius, who we've talked about in the past, Socrates sought a code for human behavior. So um, he wanted to seek out um, what was an exemplary, an exemplary, excuse me, way to live. How should a person conduct themselves in their day-to-day -day lives? Um, he also developed a question and answer technique known as the Socratic method. So uh, he did that with his students. He was a, a very famous teacher at the time. And so he would ask his students questions one after another, basically just rapid firing questions at them. And by doing this, he forced them to examine their actual beliefs and discard any belief that could not be proven through reason. So um, in the Socratic method, basically, you're just asking questions of a person and, um, you know, forcing them to examine their beliefs. And sometimes when using this method on somebody, you would actually, you know, make that person answer a question that contradicted their former beliefs. And that's how the um, growth of your mindset would happen. All right. Whoop. Okay, so this is just a little bit more about the Socratic method, but I pretty much just explained it to you. So we're going to move on. All right, so many people in Athens, um, unfortunately, distrusted Socrates. They thought that maybe he was just a little too much too soon. And they accused him of corrupting the youth of the city. So saying, you know, he shouldn't be around our kids. He's teaching them things that they, they shouldn't have to worry about. So Socrates ended up getting arrested. And a jury in Athens convicted Socrates and sentenced him to death. So um, for corrupting the youth of Athens, he was sentenced to death. So how uh, he died was he drank some poison uh, called hemlock. And that is how he passed away. He was encouraged to escape the city um, before, you know, being sentenced to death. He was encouraged by many of his students to do so. But he said that a true citizen should not um, disobey the law. So after his death, um, the wisdoms of Socrates were collected in a book called The Dialogues. Okay, um, So obviously the Dialogues was not written by Socrates. Um, it was actually written by his student Plato, um, but all of Socrates' teachings were collected in that book. So, speaking of Plato, Plato was a student of Socrates who went on to be a great philosopher himself. Oops, didn't mean to click on his picture. Here we go. Ah, okay. So, Plato was a student of Socrates, and he wrote a book about government called The Republic. And in this book, Plato talked about basically how he did not like democracy. Um, he did not agree with it. To Plato, the perfect government would actually be the one in which philosophers would rule as kings. So Plato basically argued like, hey, the best and brightest thinkers should be the one who rule the common people. Um, basically argued that the common people weren't necessarily smart enough to rule themselves and the great thinkers should be the ones to do that for them. Plato also believed that the government should rear all children so that everyone would have equal opportunities. So he basically had this thought that at a certain age, um, people would give up their children to the care of the government. The government would raise them and send them through schooling. Um, and the idea behind this was that everybody would have equal opportunities that way because they were being brought up by the government and not individual families. This is one of those ideas that it maybe sounds okay in paper, but would definitely be super hard to actually enact in real life. So um, schools would test students on a regular basis. And those who did poorly would be sent to work while those who did well would continue their studies. That was uh, Plato's, you know, big idea. Okay, um, this was his idea to sort of even things out and um, make things fair amongst everybody. However, Plato's ideas didn't actually um, ever happen in real life. Many of his other ideas about government, though, have influenced modern governments. 
Aristotle, um, he's another great Greek philosopher, and he was actually a student of Plato's. Here in this picture, this is Plato, and this is Aristotle. And Aristotle was one of the greatest scientists of the ancient world. Um, Aristotle believed in using logic and reason to explain events, to explain natural events, uh, rather than the anger or pleasure of the gods to explain events. Again, at this point in time, there's this shift from actually looking for evidence to explain things, for logic and reason to explain events, um, instead of just saying, oh, it's the gods' will. Okay, so uh, Aristotle was really big on that. He studied nature, and um, he found actual causes for things instead of just saying that it was the God's will for these things to happen. Aristotle opened up a school that he called the Lyceum, and his school became a center of research on astronomy, zoology, geography, geology, physics, anatomy, and many other fields. So uh, this school was basically like the place to be for all of the scientists of the ancient world. And one of his most famous students was Alexander the Great, who we'll talk about goes on to conquer like all of the ancient world. Okay, we'll get back to him in a minute though. All right, so Aristotle, he ended up writing 170 books, 47 of which actually still exist today more than 2,000 years later, which is really impressive. It's very hard to um, keep things like that intact through 2,000 years. Um, that just goes to show you how influential and important his works were for them, for a good portion of them to have survived this long. Aristotle was also a philosopher who wrote about ethics, so he didn't just focus on science. He did have other passions as well, uh, such as ethics, psychology, economics, theology, politics, and rhetoric, okay? So ethics, that's basically, you know, like what's right or wrong. Psychology, I'm sure you guys understand that one. Economics is um, like uh, money, how money works. Um, theology is um, based off of uh, like religion. You guys know what politics are. And uh, rhetoric is basically the art of arguing correctly. Here are some quotes from Aristotle. I'm just going to read a couple here. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is a habit. And here's another. We think in pictures. If you wish to change what you think, change the picture. Okay, so um, he, he was a very bright man, and he had a very um, interesting way of thinking for the age that he lived in, and he became very influential. All right, guys, I'm going to stop this video right here, and we will continue talking about Greek art and literature in the next video. See you there.